This is Greg Denweiler, and you are listening to another episode of The Dividend Mailbox, a podcast about dividend growth. Our goal is to stuff your mailbox full of dividend checks and make each year's check larger than the last. So welcome everyone to the July episode of the Dividend Mailbox. I want to start today's episode off with just a brief market update. Everybody's concerned about are we going to have a recession or not? Maybe we're already in one. How higher interest rates going to go? Then we'll look at a few of our past investment ideas and how it pertains to our long-term dividend growth story. And then we're going to look at how an investor dealt with the volatility of the markets and high inflation, high interest rates, 2008. And I think it'll be a story that'll really help give you a good perspective on just a long-term view, just how to approach your investments. So let's look at what's happening currently and why the media has a million reasons why you should sell. On Wednesday at 6.30 a.m. in Denver, 8.30 8.30 on the East Coast, the inflation numbers come out and the headline blares inflation for June up 9.1%. Well, of course, 10-year Treasury yields didn't like that, so they immediately spike up to 3.07%. And the futures market, which was up a little bit before the announcement, immediately proceeds to sell off and is down 400 points. So the markets are in turmoil. They're trying to figure out whether we've got higher inflation, interest rates should go up because of that, or wait a minute, we're going to have a depression. Well, maybe not that bad, but we'll have a recession and yields will end up going down. Well, actually, the yield curve has what they call inverted. Short-term rates are are a little bit higher than longer-term rates. One-year treasuries are about three-tenths of a percent above the 10-year treasury. So that's what we call, or what what investors call, an inverted yield curve. Historically, it has been a pretty reliable indicator that a recession is potentially coming. So clearly the market is concerned. But here's an interesting note. We've, We've had this environment now for several weeks, probably going on a few months now, where where we go back and forth between worrying about high inflation, worrying about a recession. I will say that, you know, we're starting to see some seeds sown, oil's down, price of wheat's down fairly dramatically. So maybe we are getting close to a top. We'll see. But interestingly enough, Standard & Poor's tracks earnings estimates And several months ago, the earnings estimates for the S&P 500 for 2022 was $225. That's been out there for several months, and we've had more time to see high inflation numbers and companies coming out with potential earnings problems and and supply supply chain problems, higher costs. The estimate was $225 a share, and as we speak right now, it's $223.50. So analysts have only cut estimates by $1.50 for 2022 so far. And surprising, or maybe not, the number for 2023 is $248. That basically has not changed since the beginning of the year. So whatever big fears we have, apparently... They're not too big yet because revisions from analysts have not have not really started to come in yet. Now, of course, that can all change in a heartbeat. And we've got earnings that are going to start coming out here. Well, they've already started. PepsiCo was, was what, a day or two ago. They actually came in with a pretty decent number, and the stock's holding up fairly well. Having said all that, even in this period of uncertainty, the S&P 500 dividend is now up to $65. The dividend yield or the dividends that are actually paid continue to grow. And as we've seen, 
even in light of a recession, companies are committed to their dividends. Clorox just raised their dividend. You know, we, we've hit on Clorox. I don't want to talk about it for very long because you can go back to some of the previous episodes where we mention it a lot more. But one of the things we want to do is try to be accountable. Clorox right now is $147 a share. We first started buying it around $160, put on most of the position, probably around $140 to $144. And year to date, the stock is down 14%. But for the second quarter, it's actually up 5%. So the stock is starting to, to perform a little bit better. One of the reasons we bought it was because of margins. Um, they've had very stable margins, cost of goods sold for the last several decades. That we're looking for things to normalize and for them to adjust pricing to account for inflation and basically the, the business to return back to mean. That, that's been the story. But one of the things that we've mentioned, I think, in the past that we were not worried about, but we just expected was the dividend growth will probably slow down for the next few years, but then it'll get back on track to being plus 6% or better. Well, Clorox announced a 2% hike in the dividend. Some people, I even saw a few comments that somebody thought that the dividend was going to get cut. Well, they raised it 2%, 2 cents. It's just another fact these companies don't like to cut dividends unless they just have to. And you've got a good long-term track record here, consistent, predictable management. And, you know, sure enough, they're barely earning the dividend at the moment, but you got to look at the long-term story. Revenue growth is still there. Long-term debt's coming down. Share, share count's coming down. So that's what's going on with Clorox. And then we've also, we've also mentioned the oil story. And this one, you know, we kind of backed away from it. We brought up the oil story, but we never really had a chance to do much with it because oil immediately started to go up, Chevron started to go up, and I just didn't feel comfortable buying it at, at the time above. Uh, we were shooting for around 112. Well, shoulda, woulda, coulda, because the stock got all the way up to a high of 182, given what happened here recently. Luckily, we already had decent positions in oil beforehand. But part of the story is we've owned it for a long time. 182 was a new all-time high, and it was significantly higher than the previous high. So one might think, hmm, stocks had a big move in here, gone from 120 to 182. Maybe I should take profits. Well, I can tell you right now, I have no interest in selling it. The dividend is still 4%. Even though it's at 139 right now, I'm sure it would have been nice to have, uh, you know, had a, a clear view in the rear view mirror that, um, you know, the stock was gonna, was gonna sell off 40 points. You just never know what's gonna happen. But the long term story, the oil story just hasn't changed. Rig count really hasn't changed that much. It's hanging around 750 rigs, which is way below where it's been in the past when oil was $100. In fact, they, it should be up probably around 1,500 rigs. So there's, they're still not looking for that much. And then you look at the government. They've restricted some of the offshore drilling in the past. That's been about 30% of our oil production. So we're not going to be getting as much there. And then the brilliant politicians over in Britain decided that they're going to put a 25% windfall profits tax on oil and gas companies that are producing oil in the British North Sea because they're making way too much money. Well, you know, the plan is, is to give, they estimate, roughly $6 billion to the people of Britain who are struggling with high energy prices. And, you know, unfortunately, and you got to feel sorry for them, they're, they're going to try to help, um, you know, help their population out with high oil and gas prices. But... <laughs> It's not too hard to figure out. This might help them for the next 12 months or 24 months. But how fast do you think some of these big international oil companies are going to rush out to the North Sea to drill more oil when 25% of their profits are immediately gone? Their cost structure just went up by 25%. It doesn't exactly encourage production. 
everybody wants to move over to a, to a greener economy. Well, sure. But the problem is we're just not there yet. And they're doing everything they can to discourage these companies from going out and, and finding oil. So we're probably going to end up paying the price for it. We'll see. That's what makes a market. But I really have no interest in selling Chevron. If it comes down a little bit more, maybe in the future, you know, we'll, we'll spend part of a podcast going back to the oil story and, and, and where we start looking. Interestingly enough, one of Brookshire Hathaway's now larger positions is, is Occidental, and they continue to be fairly aggressive buying it. So apparently, I'm not the only one who's figured this out. Anyway, so that's kind of a quick update there as far as, you know, what's going on. I think it's, you know, normal that people are going to want to look at podcasts, you know, read things, trying to figure out, hey, is a recession coming? Are we in it? What do I do? How should I invest? Give you some idea maybe of, of what to expect here in the near term or how to interpret some of this data that comes out on the economy or a stock you're following. To be perfectly honest, I do the same thing. I think it's normal. Everybody does that on some level or another. You know, you're sort of looking for some answer. Well, we don't have any silver bullets. But I'm going to share a story with you that hopefully makes it clear that you really don't need any silver bullets. Part of this I'm just going to read out of Wikipedia because it sums it up really well. I read part of this story in the Wall Street Journal several years ago when the guy died. Um, the Wall Street Journal did an article on him. So I know that uh, the story is basically true. But let's look at Ronald Reed now, who was born in October 23rd, 1921. Now, Reed worked for almost a quarter of a century as an attendant and mechanic at Haviland's service station, a gas station that he and his older brother Fred later purchased and then sold upon retiring. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I actually remember driving in the 70s when I was in high school and back in the 60s going to the service station and somebody would come out and clean your windshield and my mom would give them the credit card and they'd sign the little slip, and it wasn't exactly a glamorous job. But continuing on with the story, he retired in 1979. They had sold the station, and his retirement lasted for a year. He then worked part-time at J.C. Penney. I want you to remember that, where he did custodial and maintenance work before retiring in 1997 after working there for 17 years. I think most people would define that as just a level of survival. Reed's hobbies included wood chopping, stamp collecting, and coin collecting. He frequently drove his car to his family's homestead and stored firewood he chopped there and looked for tree branches on the ground to use for the wood-burning stove at his house. Reed frequently patronized the Brattleboro Memorial Hospital's coffee shop to drink one cup of coffee and eat a breakfast of an English muffin with peanut butter. After the coffee shop closed, he began to eat breakfast at Friendly's. Reed met the hospital development director, who suggested he check out the library and help him secure his first library card in 2007. He regularly visited the library to return a pile of books and check out another pile. Reader's Digest said Reed was a blue-collar guy with blue-chip smarts. Now, you got to realize, you're going to hear a lot of references to a lot of magazines from a guy who owned a gas station. So the Wall Street Journal noted that his roughly $2,380 purchased of 39 shares of Pacific Gas and Electric Company on January 13, 1959, grew to $10,735 by the time he died. Reed bought many shares of J.M. Smucker Company, CVS Health, Johnson & Johnson, and held for long term several blue chip companies, including Procter & Gamble, J.P. Morgan Chase, General Electric, and Dow Chemical Company. He focused on companies that paid generous dividends. Hmm. 
somebody's podcast is named that, which he would reinvest until purchasing additional stock. He did not invest in technology companies and the stock du jour because he concentrated largely on companies he knew about. When he died, he had no fewer than 95 stocks that were diversified in many industries such as healthcare, telecommunications, public utilities, rail transport, banks, and consumer goods. Although he owned shares of Lehman Brothers when it went bankrupt in 2008, the bankruptcy minimally affected his returns because his investments were diversified. Reed stored his stock certificates in his safety deposit box at his bank, which when piled together reached five inches high which in the old days, you used to get your dividends in the mailbox. To remain updated on his investments, he relied on the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, and the public library near him. Reed read the Wall Street Journal daily. You notice he kind of just kept it simple. His neighbors, family, and friends did not know the scale of the money he had amassed. Reed used a safety pin on his fraying khaki denim jacket so he could continue wearing it and put on shabby flannel shirts. Reed was a regular at a friendly's, oh, you gotta laugh at this, where a one time patron paid for his meal because the patron thought Reed could not afford the meal. He owned a used 2007 Toyota. Reed's lawyer said despite his being a millionaire, whenever he visited, he parked in the, in the further parking spaces that did not have parking meters. The Boston Globe called Reed the epitome of Yankee frugality, according to those who knew him. Despite the limited salary from his employment, he was able to amass a substantial fortune through purchasing equities. The Washington Post praised Reed how a man of modest means accumulated so much wealth, lessons for saving that apply to all of us. The Wall Street Journal said, besides being a good stock picker, he displayed remarkable frugality and patience, which gave him many years of compounded growth. At the time of his death, his estate was $8 million. He gave away $2 million to his stepchildren, he donated $4.8 million to Brattleboro Memorial Hospital and $1.2 million to Brooks Memorial Library. Both of these bequests were the largest donations that either institution had received. So I hope you guys uh, enjoyed that little story. Is a recession coming? Are we in it? Let's look at a few takeaways do some reverse engineering and just see how Mr. Reed handled the situation. If you go back to 2014 in June, which was when Mr. Reed died, the S&P 500 was at 1960. We're just going to use 8 million as the terminal value for his portfolio. At that point, the dividend itself was $39 for the S&P 500. That was a 2% dividend yield. So in 2014, the income for Mr. Reed was probably right around 160000 In fact, I would venture to say it was a little higher than that because if you're in a, if you're in a dividend portfolio, you're probably at least 25 to 50% higher than what the S&P 500 dividend is. But we'll use 160000 Let's go back to September of 2007. At that point, the S&P 500 was at 1526. So that was 22% below of what it was in, in June of 2014. So his portfolio would have roughly been probably $6.2 million. Well, at that point, you, you got to step back and say, all right, the guy is 85 years old and he's basically 100% in equity. If he took that portfolio into pretty much any advisor in the country, not every one of them, but probably uh, if he went into Merrill Lynch or Charles Schwab or Fidelity, they'd all tell him, oh, you got to sell at least 50% of this portfolio and get out of the stock market. And, you know, you hear uh, the age waiting that you should have a, a percentage of your portfolio in the equity market minus your age. 
Well, that would mean that if you take 85, he should have sold all but 15% of it. Anyway, he's got $6.2 million. And if we still use the dividend yield, he's got about $112,000 of income. Well, here's the thing I want you to realize. Because right now the market's down 25%. You're wondering, what should I do about a recession? March of 09, at that point, the guy's 87 years old. His portfolio is probably somewhere around $3.2 million. He's lost, well, he hasn't lost anything. But his portfolio has declined by almost 50%. But here's one of the keys and the big takeaways. His income in 2009 was at least $97,000 because that's what the S&P 500 dividend was. You have to think the guy is maybe wondering a little bit, I've lived on nothing. I use safety pins to keep my clothes together and I've lost half my net worth. I don't know if he's thinking that or not, but I can tell you, that the fact that he's got ninety, at least $97,000 coming in the mail probably helped him feel a little bit better. And, he, you know, and he's thinking, I'll just keep buying because apparently that's what he did. Well, March of 2013, the market had recovered. It was back to 1569. So within, you know, within three years, we're basically four years, we're basically back to even. But the dividend yield on the S&P 500 at that point was $31.80. So it had already, it had already risen a little bit through that period. And now he's getting $130,000 a year of income and his portfolio is recovered, but he's earning almost 20% more. And over that period of the last three years of, of the recession and the market recovery, He's brought in almost $400,000 of income. Well, you get out to 2014 and he's at $8 million. His income at that point was running at a run rate of, of 160000 because it's a dividend portfolio. He's up somewhere probably around 200000 So, you know, the lesson to learn if he did nothing over those seven years, which he basically did nothing, he earned about $900,000 of income. It's just the simple fact of letting the dividends grow and then the whole power of compounding. So, you know, one big takeaway was Ronald Reed was great about getting on the line and just staying on the line. And for those of you who haven't listened to one of the previous podcasts, the line is just the dividend of the S&P 500 and how over the last hundred years, it's grown at an average rate of 6%. You know, the second thing is the key part that makes this work is the sustainable dividend growth. You want to own stocks that can grow their dividends. And in the end, that helps solve all your problems if you've got some patience and discipline, because as the dividends grow, eventually the stock prices reflect that. So it's, it is a different strategy than just buying a high dividend. So those are two big things that I think that, you know, in the environment that we're in, it really has a lot of, it has a lot of lessons to it. The power of compounding lets a guy who basically barely earned enough money to live to give a hospital almost $5 million, which is more than probably most people that have $50 million give away. So it's a pretty incredible story. I'm throwing that in there because, you know, you can wake up, you can worry about the current inflation number, you can worry about we are or we are not going to go into a recession. But if you have a time horizon that's more than a few years, it's all about consistency, it's all about compounding, and it's all about growing that dividend stream. It's not the only way to invest, but it works. Keep in mind, a fairly significant piece of Ronald Reed's investment time horizon was in the 70s. And the 70s was a, was a period of some pretty scary inflation, high interest rates. I mean, we're not even close to where we were in the 70s yet. He still 
achieved some pretty phenomenal results. So just be careful when you see these headlines. They grab your attention, but you just got to stay focused. And I'm going to use, you know, Clorox is a great example right now. The story, it hasn't changed. You know, we're going to get a quarterly report on it. Their earnings very well could still, um, they're probably not going to be that great because they still have problems with inflation and their cost of goods. But they've got products that are enduring. They're long term. It's a hundred year old company. I have a feeling that, you know, you, I don't even think you can get a, a certificate anymore. Everything is held in what they call street name now. But if you could, it's one of the stocks that you could probably put in your safety deposit box and your heirs will pull it out someday and it's probably going to be worth a whole lot more money. So don't let these headlines get you too, uh, get you too wrapped up in what's going to happen in the next few days. And really view them more as as opportunities, I think. And one of the great things about dividends, you get a little bit of cash flow every quarter. If the market's down, you can buy more instead of having to sell something or just wait for it to come back up. So there are advantages to it. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please leave us a review and follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. If you would like more information regarding dividend growth or just our style of investing, go to growmydollar.com. There you will find some of our previous podcasts and also our monthly newsletter. If you have any questions or anything to add regarding today's podcast, email ethan at growmydollar.com. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Each investor should consider whether a strategy is right for them and all the risk involved. Dividend stocks are volatile and can lose money.